Wi-Fi Sheep would like to say a huge thank you to all of you that kindly support us. Help us continue to bring new videos like this. Join patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep from just $1 a month. Hello everybody and welcome back to Wi-Fi Sheep right here on YouTube with me Tom and our very first video of 2022. If you didn't join me for our New Year's Eve live stream then can I wish you a very happy New Year and I hope you had a great Christmas holiday period. Now during the Christmas period our focus here on the channel ended up mainly being a lot of Commodore content. That was mainly because a lot was going on in the C64 and Commodore retro computing world at that time. One such project that did show up and was very interesting was apparently for a Commodore 64 uh, kernel that could actually run on an Arduino Nano. I didn't get a chance to cover this properly during the Christmas content so here we are as the first video of a brand new year and we're going to look at it. But I saw this and to be honest with you my opinion was there is absolutely no way that can be a thing that works. To help illustrate my point this is a Commodore 64. Well actually it's a clone, it's the C64, so it's a modern 2019 clone. But just for illustrative purposes, just pretend this is a Commodore 64. Okay, so the original machines were 8-bit and they ran on a MOS 6510 microprocessor, which was a uh, modified version of the original 6502. And they ran at about 1 megahertz, or just under, if you had the power version. And the big thing about the C64, or the Commodore 64, was it had 64K, that's 64 kilobytes, of RAM. Okay, or 64,000 bytes. And that was enough to do what this machine did. Now, this is the Arduino Nano. They've been around for about 10 years now, and if you follow us here on the channel, you will know we use these quite extensively in our tiny basic computers video series. It's a microcontroller powered by the Atmega 328p micro uh, processor. These run at a clock speed of 16 megahertz, so they're powerful enough, but the machines, or the boards rather, only have 2k or 2 kilobytes of RAM. So can you begin to see my problem? Commodore 64, 64k, Reno Nano, 2k. So this project, which here it is online, it's been picked up officially and endorsed by the Arduino uh, company or project in itself. Here is the listing online, which we'll go into in a minute. Clearly shows that it is possible to build a rig to make this happen. But I, I, <laughs> I'm struggling because not only does the nano board run the kernel, it then runs the basic interpreter and it generates the video. So it does some sort of VIC or VIC-2 emulation to generate video signal, uh, be it a black or white composite one. Well, all that just in 2K of RAM? Seriously? I mean, our project for Tiny Basic Computers, we ended up using two Arduinos, one to run as our main basic kernel, and the other acted purely as a dumb terminal or video out, so not to take away precious RAM resources from our main system. And even then, we only had about 1K of RAM available to actually execute code. So, I... <laughs> You can see why I'm having some belief issues here with this project. But I thought, hey, it looks fascinating enough to do. It's so similar to what we've been doing with Tiny Basic Computers. I definitely know I've probably got enough parts around here somewhere to make this happen. So, you know, let's see if we can actually make this work and find out if it's actually any good. But first, it's a brand new year and PCBGoGo.com have got a very special offer just for you. PCBGoGo.com free PCB event is ongoing right now. It's now free for a one to two layer FR4 PCB measuring no more than 100 by 100 millimeters. PCBGoGo is a quick turnaround PCB prototype manufacturer from China with over 10 years experience in the PCB industry. They offer FR4 boards, Rogers, Copper, Flex and Rigid Flex for PCB prototype and assembly services. Click the first link in the description to this video and upload your Gerber files. Take advantage of this amazing and free offer today from PCBGoGo.com. Terms and conditions apply. 
So for the next bit of this project, I thought we might use the Raspberry Pi 400. I know I'm going a little off topic here, but I've actually ended up using the Pi 400 quite a lot just as my go-to development machine. So it's been really, really impressive. Um, and I, for one, am normally quite a skeptic of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, but this machine, 400, which is a Pi 4 base machine in all-in-one case, but like an 80s microcomputer, is absolutely fantastic and one of the fastest and most powerful pies you can buy at the moment. So I've been using this kind of in place of my burner laptops that we were using before. So on screen I've got a capture going for it. We've got a Chromium web browser and we have the project here. So this is the here we are the Arduino Commodore 64 project and it's all open source and you can see here the picture of it running on a breadboard very very similar to the kind of things we've done with tiny basic uh, and oh by the way it's from dr vault here so i will give you a link so you can see this for yourself this is from the official arduino project hub page and it shows you what you need but going through this i reckon there's some parts missing uh, and the one part i absolutely don't have is this rectifier so I have some switching diodes that we'll try in place, but I don't have the correct rectifier at the moment, so that might be problematic. Um, so also it talks about the memory map. Now, in the intro, I said I could not for the life of me figure out how this worked. Um, but it shows you here how it breaks down the tiny amount of memory. So you've got 20k in flash to run a basic ROM, a kernel, uh, character ROM. Uh, you can see where the basic runs and the bytes, video RAM 1K. It splits the SRAM into two. Uh, then it also then uses the EEPROM as running RAM. So that's where you get 1K of RAM running from. It's using the EEPROM, which is the onboard storage space of a Nano, to uh, use as system RAM, tying up the other 2K with things like kernel basic ROM, uh, video RAM, etc. So very, very clever. It defaults to PAL, and it has this, what I can only describe as a rather complicated uh, NTC or PAL composite routine. Um, this is a lot more complicated than the type we've used for getting composite out of Arduinos for tiny basic computers, but it's generating a much higher resolution image. These pictures here, you can see there's something going on there. There's another diode or transistor or something in place that's not on the schematic. Um, and you can see it, it generates a quite a high resolution image, much higher than anything we've generated. So, yeah, um, here's the source, which I have downloaded, and here is the schematic, uh, both in pictorial form, which is kind of like what we've done before with tiny basic computers, and as a diagram. But I, this component here worries me. Everything else I think I can probably source. So I saved a bit of time. I did download the sketch. And here it is in the Arduino IDE running natively on Raspberry Pi on the Raspberry Pi OS or Raspbian Linux. And there's quite a lot to it. So you've got here's the basic interpreter, which is hex and a lot of hex, bitmap images, the character ROM, which will be hex again. Um, what's that? C CPU. That's the emulator for emulating a 6502 registers on an Atmega 328p microcontroller. So it emulates the hardware layer. Um, so anything, what else have we got? There's a lot. Uh, keyboard logic. So, so it causes a lot of external libraries, but there's a lot going on here. What we can do is making sure we've actually got our board we're going to be using selected so we go tools board it should be down as nano uh it may be the old it may be the new bootloader i think the one i'm going to use is the old and the port will be would be usb if we had anything plugged in we can just verify the source code and make sure that's going to work okay let's make sure we do have all the libraries and things installed You may find if you're running this on x86 PC or Mac or even the M1 Max, you may find that this will run better. So yeah, it works, but it talks about low memory, and I'm not surprised because it's using every byte of space available. Now the board I've got here, here is a clone Arduino Nano. 
uh, which we'll try. I think this one has the old bootloader. You need to watch out for the clones because they have a mixture of old or new bootloaders or no bootloader at all. We've covered bootloaders before under our Tiny Basic Computers project. Um, these clones also use a USB to serial driver and they have a chip underneath that drives that. It's just about here. And it needs the C CH340, 341 drivers. If you're on Mac or PC, if you're on Linux, like I am with the Raspberry Pi, you don't need any drivers. This should just work, which is really, really helpful. So I've got a standard USB A to mini USB. It's not micro, it's mini on these mini USB cable. So we'll just plug and get my connector in. There we go. Plug that in that end and load the cables everywhere. We can plug straight into the remaining spare. USB port on the back of the uh, 400. That'll light up. Um, now, let's go to tools. And you should see the port is already switched now to uh, USB zero. And we should be able to get some board info. It is reading the board. So with a bit of luck, we should be able to upload. And you can see the uh, loading light, the red loading light is on. Um, so it's definitely receiving data. I say that, it's, it's TXRX serial. There we are. There we go. It's done. And it has successfully flashed, you can see on the screen. So that's brilliant. So we can take this out now. There we go. And this board is now ready for the next part of our project, which if we go back to the web page, is building something that looks a little bit like this. Okay, so now we've done what we needed to do with the Raspberry Pi 400. I've uh, gone and packed that away. We've got here our now flashed clone Arduino Nano, which should have the C64 kernel and ROMs now uploaded. So next thing we need is a breadboard, and I've got one here. Um, as you can see in the diagram, so i to make sure these are the correct way around, and this has the blue rail, negative rail on the top, so that's the orientation. If you're not familiar with how these work, very simple. These are broken up into uh, four sections. Um, the power rails at the top and bottom are all linked together, one and two, like that. And then you've got one and two down here. These two rails aren't linked, but all the pins along are. You've then got a sort of big ridge in the middle of the board, which separates these two sections. And these are columns, and each column is attached as so. Um, so basically, there to there isn't connected, or up here to sort of over here isn't connected, but through is. Um, very, very useful boards. We did a full explanation, again, referring back to our own tiny basic computers project, which if you're interested in any of these kind of Arduino computer building, do go and check that out. Anyway, we're going to try building this. So the first thing we need to do is put our Arduino board in and we don't want these pins shorting out. So we put the board over the gap between the big ridge in between and that will separate the board. So let's push the board like that and that separates the board like so. So that's fantastic. So that's now in. I've got here, I'll just dig them out some little pre-cut jumpers which would be ideal for our needs so let's see if we can fit some jumpers however we need to so we want to connect ground which is labeled here there's a ground pin and we want to tie that to the top so that's ground on uh, we then want ground and voltage need to be attached here at the bottom. So ground will be, hang on, voltage, which is VIN here. Voltage is going to attach to the red and ground, which is next to it, is going to link to the blue. Okay, there we go. So that's now linked correctly. I'm going to do a slight modification onto this diagram. So what I'm going to do is we want to go from pin D2, which is here, and we want to come out like 
to this row running down here. So that goes in like that. So now we need to add the resistors. So it's 1K link down the bottom. Now I only found this really big, slightly overkill 1000 ohm resistor. It'll be fine. It's just a bit big compared to a normal resistor size, but it'll do. It just means it could take a, a lot more voltage. And we'll link that from the bottom here to the power rail. These don't have any polarity, so you can go either way and that links in like that. Next we'll do the diode. Now I don't have the rectifier. I have a silicon switching diode which looks nigh and identical but it's not. It's not the right part. Um, I have no idea in all honesty if this is going to work but we'll put it in. So that's going in at D3. So we'll bridge from D3 and it goes in line with where we put the red jumper. Now diodes are polarised. They do have to go the correct way around. And in this case, you can see with the diagram, and also here, there's a little sort of mark. If I just zoom in, you can see, if we can keep focus, there we go. You can see there's this little mark here, um, which shows you which way around a diode would actually need to go. And then finally, just up here, we need to put a I think it's 820 ohm resistor. I'm just checking what it is. Yes, 820 ohm. Here is an 820 ohm. Again, there's no particular way around this has to go. It just has to go in the right place, which obviously helps. And this is bridging from the TX rail here. So it's going to go in there and then it's going to connect. Now, the next thing would be to add the video connector. Um, what I've decided to do is, because it's, it's a composite video feed, so I've got this jumble of wires here, two um, alligator or crocodile clips, which I've got here and they're connected onto two jumpers. And the other end of the clip is connected to the positive and negative or uh, signal and ground of an RCA. That's into the television at the other side in the composite port. So we should be able to put this onto our common ground. Um, this is our video signal, which we should be able to put somewhere in line. And if we could try put the video signal in line there. Now, this should work and we could try this out very shortly. If we take a another USB lead, I've got one here. This is again, it's a mini. USB to USB A, and I've got an iPhone charger with a British standard plug on. So we'll plug that into the mains. We'll plug the other end in here. And we'll set off television to composite PAL mode. And we'll have a look and see what happens. So one final check on the board, which is just down here off camera. So here I am and it's just down here off the camera. Uh, just see it's okay. We're pointing at the TV. Sorry about there's a slight glare in the room, but you should be able to see. So let's power up and see if we get anything. Oh, okay. That took a while. It has generated a, a signal and you probably can't see this on the screen, but I can just make out a very faint Commodore boot screen. I'm just trying to, ju I'm just adjusting the, it's so, oh, there we go. It is so faint. I'm going to zoom in, see if you can see that. Can you see that? There it is. Um, I'm actually sort of touching the diode. So I think I'm creating a bit of a, a resistance in my body which is why you're seeing that on screen, but it's so faint and there's a bit of a line trace ghosting, but it is running, which is amazing. And it's even got the flashing cursor, no keyboard attached at the moment. Um, it's found a hundred, sorry, 1,124 bytes of RAM, which is just over the one K. It says it's 64 <laughs> K RAM system. It's really not, it's two, there's two in it. Um, but that's working just, but 
I have to be honest with you, this diode, which only is working when I'm touching it, um, it it's not the right diode at all, and it's actually getting really hot. So, uh, yeah, what I think we'll do is we'll try putting a keyboard on, and let's just test that. So I've got here a USB, female USB A, with uh, the connectors on, four connectors for USB 2 standard, and it's got pins on the end. So how this needs to work, and by the way, I need to make sure the board is powered down. And we want VBUS, which is voltage, is on red. And ground is here on the brown. So uh, we've got voltage here. So we'll put that onto the red rail, that onto ground. Okay, so that will give us power. And then these two are the data lines. And the data lines want to go to 11 and 10. I'm not sure which way around is which, but it doesn't matter. It won't break anything. It just won't work if it's the wrong way around. So D11 and D10, which is there. So that's now got a keyboard attached or a USB. And I've got a quite a cheap, you've seen these before. I've got quite a cheap generic keyboard. Uh, you need one that has the PS2 protocol, not just the USB protocols. We're not actually using USB, we're using PS2, the old IBM protocol. It's just it's present and can be used via some USB connectors. So not all keyboards are going to work. Let's put the keyboard in. Final check to make sure I have got the voltage to work way around. I have. And let's go back to the TV. We'll power up and see if this works. So let's power back up. Remember the keyboard is now in. Takes a minute to come back up, but let's just see what we get. Hmm. Okay. Um, that's with the keyboard in, and I'm not getting anything. Also, notice if I just show you up here, there's this sort of strange artifact on the screen. If I take the keyboard out, it sort of goes back. There you are. Goes back to being the Commodore kernel. If I put keyboard in it does this sort of strange thing and I don't think it's anything to do with the data pins if I take the data pins out the keyboard still yeah it, it kind of reverts back I don't even get that on screen now the Commodore text is very faint with it yeah this it isn't sort of working that well to be honest with you um, that could be there's either like, there's some parts missing. It may be that we need some more resistors to pull up or pull down the data pins with the keyboard. Um, or it could be the fact I'm just not using the right switching diode, which I think could have a lot to do with it. So, yeah, 50-50, but we're not quite there just yet. So where does that leave us with the project? Well, when we started the project, I was extremely dubious about if this was even a thing that would work. With most videos, it's nice if you say, oh my God, there's this thing, we don't know if it's gonna work, we do a video and then it works perfectly at the end and it goes, yes, it works, it's fantastic. However, in reality, that's not always the case. So we are where we are. I have a feeling, as I said in my running commentary, that it's more to do with the fact I don't have the right parts. I'm also a little skeptical if the diagrams provided are actually missing some components. Looking at those photos, as I said, in the, again, in the commentary, if you look at the photos, it seems to show stuff like other resistors and things connected to the keyboard data lines that aren't there in the finished diagram rather. So I don't know at the moment. I've got some parts on order and we'll give it a month or so and we'll come back, we'll revisit this. I am hopeful because we did get some kind of picture on the screen and there was definitely a C64 kernel that loaded up. So if it was a blank screen, I'd be really disillusioned and disappointed at this point in time. But the fact it does sort of work means we've got some mileage in this. So make sure you don't miss out on the future developments of this particular project. If you haven't done so already, please do consider liking and subscribing to us here on Wi-Fi Sheep. You can follow me on Twitter. It's at Wi-Fi Sheep. That's at Wi-Fi Sheep on Twitter. Make sure you don't miss out on any future content. Click that notification bell right here on YouTube. And I hope to see you real soon right here on the channel. Until next time, Happy New Year and bye for now.